John, I know, I know you come across as a very humble man. So I'm not sure if you, if you're going to like this. This might uh, be slightly awkward for you, but you know, very unabashedly, I'm going to do it anyway. Oh my goodness! Oh, oh my! No need for that. No need for that. But, but hi, how are you? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. You know, I, I was watching. Uh, I was listening to a, a very recent podcast of yours, uh, and you uh, described uh, Richie Beno, you know, the great late uh, Richie Beno, mm. as the doyen of uh, of commentary. Um, you know, for me, you know, for me, growing up in the early two thousands, watching the Premier League coverage in India, you, you know, uh, are the doyen of sports broadcasting for me as well. You know, definitely learned a lot from you, and it's a pleasure, you know, having this conversation with you. No, oh, you're most welcome. Thank you very much. It's it's, you know, we I think very often you you're fortunate to be just in the right place at the right time, or you're, you're there at a time when you work for a, a broadcaster or in, in, in a sport that has a lot of uh, exposure, uh, and as a result, you know, you you, you take on this uh, role in people's uh, lives, um, and and I'm always grateful to it, which is which is why you know when whenever anyone reaches out to me and says, hey, let's have a chat, then then I'll try and try and make it happen where possible. And th- and thank you so much, you know, for accepting my invite. Uh, look, you've got a very atypical career background. Uh, you were an English literature major when you were in college. Uh, uh, mm. Something that you wouldn't associate with a sports presenter. But given the fact that, you know, you've got a very atypical background, you get asked a very typical question, which is, John, can you walk me through your, your unique background? But since this podcast <laughs> is uh, anything but typical, you know, I'm not going to mm. start off on a typical note. Instead, I'm going to start off by asking you an atypical question. What is it that you love the most about presenting? Presenting. Well, that's a very, very interesting question because that kind of taps into my background um, because presenting is a very interesting term, isn't it? I mean, you know, if you apply presenting to business, you'll find that there are people who who stand in front of a room and with a, a PowerPoint or whatever they might be using or they even get into a sort of metaverse environment and, and they're just naturally good at it. Right. So 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 that that's the broad description of presenting. Um, I think. Um, Doing everything with the benefit of hindsight, um, you know, talking to my, my my parents when I first started doing television, um, they said, well, yeah, you, 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 you always were quite good at stringing words together and, and uh, you, you went on stage a couple of times as a kid. But I'll tell you this, the first time anybody asked me to be a TV presenter, I turned them down flat um, because... I was a, uh, you know, I, I was a product of the the late '70s um, in terms of my formative years. So that informed me in terms of the music I like. I like I like heavy metal and rock and punk music, and and, and I'm kind of a little bit, you know, anti-establishment in many ways. And and, and that was the kind of era I grew up in in Britain. Um, I think in hand in hand with everything else, there was um, a teenage kind of rebelliousness and and a, and a, and, a, and, a, and a sort of iconoclastic feel to everything that I did. So this is a long-winded way of saying that when I became a, a journalist, it was effectively because I, I loved writing and I loved reading and I loved uh, long-form journalism especially. So I, I was <clears throat> very fortunate when I lived in Hong Kong to find myself working for an English, the English language uh, daily paper there, where I, I just had this incredible um, good fortune to fast track from being a sports reporter to a feature writer, to a columnist, to uh, an editor, um, to a film critic, to, um, I, you know, I, I worked in some really amazing uh, spaces as a, as, a, as, a, as a writer learning my craft. And in doing that, I was really fully satisfied um, to be doing that. But People came to me from from a TV company because at the time I was writing entertainment and asked me if I'd be a, an entertainment broadcaster if I'd do a film critic for them or, or some some what have you, and I just said I said look going in front of a camera that's cheesy <laughs> that that's you know I, I I sit down and write stuff I I I take the Mickey out of people who go on TV because they're they're, they're like you know Ron Burgundy you know I, I, that that. That, that was like, you know, my sort of angry young man position on that. So I, I initially turned around and said, oh, no, I, I don't I'll do that. Thanks for the offer. But then a few months later, the same broadcaster came back and said, look, you know, really, do us a favor. Sit in front of a camera and, and, and do something. So the very first time I agreed to do it, I actually went on a TV show and I said, but I'll do this, but I want you to interview me. I don't mind being interviewed, but I don't want to look at a camera and sort of say, hey, guys, John Dykes here. And I'm here. You know, <laughs> I just I said I won't do that. So I went and did the show and, and they asked me, you know, my thoughts about a few films. And, and, I, and, I, and I got got back. And the next day I got a, I got a message from, from the channel and the producer said, look, my boss has said that was great. But next time you really do need to look at the camera and do it yourself. 
So <laughs> I, I then I then started doing a film uh, thing where I would, you know, very sort of sarcastically, like a smart ass that I was, you know, review films. And, you know, I love films, so I wasn't doing it all negatively. Um, but I, I found I could do it because I found I could, I, because of my journalistic training, I could, I could structure a stream of, of, of consciousness into some, some structured ideas um, and I could deliver it. I found that I had the knack. In those days, we didn't have a, a prompt or a tele. You know, a teleprompter or auto cue, no chance. Um, so you had to memorize everything. So I basically found that I could memorize and deliver a, uh, you know, a two or three minute sort of, you know, film segment. Um, and I did that. So, so that's, that's how I started. Um, so, 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 so being a presenter just happened to be something that I found I could do. Um, it's very interesting because going back to your question, which is, you know, what do you love about being a presenter? I can tell you the things I don't love about being a presenter. I.e., I don't like or love some people's motivation, which is pure narcissism. You know, this has to be on camera and as many people as possible have to see it. No, definitely not into that. I am the cleverest guy in the room. Therefore, I have to get my opinion out there. No, I definitely don't like that either. Um, you know, that, that, that's wrong. Oh, if I do this, it will lead me to a lot of money. Okay. Yeah. I, I can understand that. If people think that there's that, there's that motivation in my case, quite honestly, uh, I think it was, um, I've done this and people have hired me because they think I can do this. Um, and that was like, okay, great. So I have a, a skill or I have a, ha have something that I can, that I can do. Um, so, so what I think I love about it is the fact that it enables me to do a job that I love. I, the, the pleasure I get from it isn't the fact that I look at a camera and go, Hey, you're looking at me and I'm saying this, and I just used a really cool word or, or, or I've just emoted really well, <laughs> you know, that that's not what I love about it at all. And in fact, to this day, a bit like, as you know, when you do an interview and maybe you've done it with a single camera, which means that when you've finished the interview, the camera's just been pointing at the subject, you have to have the camera turned at you and you have to do noddies as they call them. You know, I feel so self-conscious. And in fact, even to this day, watching myself back on video, sometimes I feel self-conscious. So that's not, the, that's not the pleasure for me. No, the pleasure comes for me from the fact that I'm a presenter enables me to be part of a broadcast. And I love being part of a broadcast, particularly a good broadcast. So when, when, the, when what I call the unity of it is there, i.e. when you have great content, great guests, uh, a, a relevant topic, you're taking the audience into a space that's, that's really engaging, that's what I love. So that, therefore, is, is, is a byproduct of being a presenter or the other mm -hmm. way around. There's a long answer for you. But I think, you know, John, that, that, that beautifully sums up how I look at John Dykes, the presenter as well. You know, because uh, as you rightly said, a lot of people might be willing to go into the field only because of the attention that you end up getting. But the attention, as you mm. said, is a byproduct of you yeah. loving what you're doing. And, you know, whenever I think of John Dykes, the presenter, I always feel that you're someone who's never stealing the guest thunder. You know, you're expressing as opposed to impressing. Uh, and you know that, you know, Unless, of course, you know, you're doing something like the John Dyke show. If you're if you're working on something else that's not your show, you know that you're not the you're not the, the main protagonist. You're not the main character. And you're well aware of that. And that's how you come across as well, which is why I think people are drawn to you. Well, I, I, thanks. Thanks for that. I, I think two things. Firstly, when I first started out, um, my mentor in terms of the guy who gave me my first break in sports broadcasting, uh, he was a guy. Uh, he is a guy called Rick Dovey, uh, a, a very um experienced australian uh producer very hard bitten um old school came from a from from sort of a Mur murdoch organization background and, and was this was when i was with star and an espn star and um you know i i i went on i was i think i was i was doing a, a single presenter um, ashes series or some some test cricket that we didn't put much coverage around then i was literally just popping up in vision um and linking to sessions of play then we'd just go to the world feed coverage and i remember there was one where just before lunch there'd been a very contentious decision and, and, and the umpire had made a, a really interesting call uh, way back in the days before any kind of, you know, uh, DRS or anything like that. And, 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 and I remember coming back after that session and doing this thing saying, okay, so the score is so-and-so, so-and-so, we're about to resume them with these guys at the crease, uh, but let's not forget, you know, as, and, and we got shots of the umpires walking out. Let's not forget that really big call made by umpire so-and-so. And I think you're all going to have an opinion on this and what have you. So I, I did all that through to commentary, walked out 
into the pantry to get a coffee or something like that. And, and Rick walked by and he just said, yeah, it's all going great, Darcy. But he said, just remember, I don't pay you to have an opinion, mate. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's just his way of saying, you, you know, look, present, you know, link, introduce, what have you. And then that extrapolated into broadcast where we had guests. And, you know, I think you, you have to accept that, that back in those days, we fully understood that the, that the, the pundits were hired to, to bring their experience and, and knowledge and insights. Uh, your job as a host was to elicit what you could that was relevant. You work hand in hand with a producer who has a vision for what, what he or she wants from, from the broadcast. And, you know, that was very clear cut. Now, this, of course, is going against so many trends today where we're all told that we have to personal brand, where everyone can be a broadcaster, where <laughs> it's very hard to differentiate between um, um, pundits and, and, and civilians, if you want. You know, basically, we're, we're in a world now where, where the barriers have broken down. But maybe I sound like I'm, I, I'm, I'm a sort of a diehard or a stick in the mud or what have you. But I still firmly believe that this, what I call the unity of the broadcast, only, only works properly if every component of it recognizes that the ultimate goal is to deliver a piece of content whereby you use your skills to, to, to deliver what we think is the best for the audience. And, and I've said this just now, but, you know, if, if a producer says we're going to bring this, we're going to book this guest to come in, then that means that my job is to understand where the strength lies with this particular guest, mm -hmm. the knowledge that they have, the insights that they're likely to bring. When a situation is evolving on a cricket or a football or a rugby or whatever it may be pitch, and we feel that there's a talking point, then, then my job is to not show off that I know the answer or I have an opinion. No, to, 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 to get that from them, to take it into a conversational area that's interesting, to, to get the audience's curiosity peaked. And, and I think that's very, very important. And I think too often these days, I think I see that the, the, the roles reversed a little bit too much, or I think there's an imbalance. Um, and if you do have a high opinion of what I do or what I did or continue to do, and if others do, then I'd like to hope it's because I, I understand that I'm a subordinate part of this broadcast that, that ultimately is, is meant to be bringing the best out of everybody. And John, this this high uh, this this skill or this this art that you highlighted is something that we we definitely saw, you know, in abundance on football focus. Whenever I think of John Dykes, or whenever you know fans in Asia in the who grew up uh, watching football in the early two thousands, you know, think of uh, John Dykes, you think of football focus. Uh, you did put out uh, a tweet. Uh, uh, this was quite some time back, you know, talking about football focus, everything that used to happen behind the scenes, uh, mm -hmm. the the premise behind the show, and one of your tweets in that tweet thread of yours was. From a personal and professional perspective, I found it really exciting to learn how to become a moderator of a discussion that might go in any direction and one featuring diverse opinions and extremely contrasting personalities. Could you, could you expand a bit more on this, uh, this skill uh, that you're talking about uh, as a moderator? Yeah, well, well, well firstly, um, I think there's one important thing that I have to put out there, and it's, it's, it's a very sad thing to put out there because you're joining me today, uh, tragically, a day after we lost Chebby Singh. Um, so Shebi passed away yesterday uh, in, in, in his home country of Malaysia, and I'm still struggling to process it, really. Uh, he was just 61 years old. So Shebi was a huge part of Football Focus. Um, but to your point, um, the whole Football Focus uh, concept was a very interesting one in that when uh, the background to it is that in the early 2000s, I was working for ESPN Star Sports, which, as you know, is a joint venture between two pr hitherto rivals, right? They'd been, you know, fighting each other for, for, for control of cricket rights and, and other things around Asia, but they came together and formed this, turned out to be a mega company. So having initially really worked hard on cricket, they then made the big play to go for Premier League football. And back in those days, in the early 2000s, it was a very fragmented Premier League scene. So what they did was, was they, they bid a, a huge amount of money and won the rights to, I, I would think, maybe 25, 26 countries around Asia. And as you know, the Premier League works in three-year rights cycles. So mm -hmm. what we did was when we launched our programming around that offering, which included the, the Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia, or across Asia, really, we put together a, an amazing raft of programming whereby we would do Match Day Live, but we would also have a Friday night show called Here We Go, which was our, which was our big preview show. And then it made sense for us on a Tuesday night to do the Football Focus show, which was our big sort of roundup analysis show. And what was interesting about that was in the first three years, obviously, we had the rights to all the footage in all of the markets. OK, so we, it was a show where traditionally we would put a lot of video on there. We would analyze stuff and break it down. It, 
it, it then had to change dramatically because three years into this, we had been so successful. That's the way I see it anyway. A number of the independent uh, individual countries uh, involved bought the rights. You know, you'd have a cable operator in Hong Kong or Singapore or, or Thailand, and they would go, OK, well, look, we've realized now what you can do with the Premier League. ESPN Star have shown us how to harness the power of the Premier League. So they would go and actually outbid us in those markets. And, you know, you know difficult to, 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 for the company to, to, to match everybody everywhere. So we lost a few territories, but we still had a huge presence in those territories in terms of we were on all the cable networks and affiliate channels. So we had to take a decision on what we did with Football Focus. Did we have to make a variety of versions, i.e. some containing footage, some not containing footage? And in the end, not just because we were lazy and didn't want to make six versions of every show, but it would have been impractical. We actually, uh, and I have to credit our, our producer, a guy called Andy Tate, who was a British guy who, who launched all of this programming and who he produced me and to this day remains my biggest influence in terms of you know how to, how to do uh, football television properly. Um, he, he sat down and he said, look, why don't we do this? Why don't we assume knowledge? Because remember, our channel also had Sports Center on it. So we were Thanks. showing highlights all the time. Why don't we assume knowledge? Why don't we just assume that the audience has seen all the things we're going to talk about, that they're fully aware of them? Okay. So in terms of moving video, we don't need it. And instead, what we'll do is we'll harness the power of the pundits that we have, and we'll turn it into a lively kind of debate. And, you know, quite honestly, I think this must have been like a forerunner to, to, to podcasts and, and the kind of things that we see very <laughs> commonplace these days. Um, so what happened at the time? By that stage, um, we had a, a core of, of pundits. So we had Jamie Reeves, who was a, a Singapore-based um, economics lecturer and a, and a former semi-pro footballer. We had Paul Macefield, who, of course, you guys see all the time working on Indian Super League. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and Paul was a, 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 a retired pro by that stage. He played to a good level and then come out to Hong Kong and Singapore. Um, and then we had Chevy. Um, bless him. May he rest in peace. Chevy had rang me from Malaysia when we were first launching the uh, – the Premier League coverage we're going to do. And he said, I've heard you guys have got the rights regionally, uh, including Malaysia. Just want to introduce myself. And he was a former Malaysian international, but he was also a real student of the game, passionate about football. And I sort of spoke to Andy, my producer, and said, hey, I've got this guy who I think could be, could be fun. You know, he sounds like he's very good. And Chevy came down from Malaysia to Singapore across the border and, and auditioned and we started using him. So for three years, everyone was part. And, and we had Steve McMahon, of course, legendary former England and, and Liverpool player uh, who had happened to have taken a job in Perth, which didn't work out in Australia. And we'd said to him, look, if, if you're happy to be away from the UK, why not just come here? So he and his wife came and lived uh, in Singapore. So th th these were, you know, amongst our core pundits. And then what we would do is we would fly uh, international names out on an occasional basis, whether it be, you know, Ian Rush or Brian Robson or any of these guys, and they'd come and do some shows. But back to the football focus. So what happened was we then took this decision. We felt we had enough diversity of opinion. We had enough um, charisma uh, in terms of the, 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 the roster of pundits that we could put a show out whereby I would just provoke a conversation and let them go and, and, and let them get into it. And, and we would try to keep a rein on it and you know as somebody who broadcasts yourself i think as, as an exercise in broadcast this was fascinating because typically at the weekends i was working on a fairly structured pre-show before a match mm -hmm. with bits of content where i'd have to be quite tight and to the time and to the minute and i'd have to be disciplined and i have a producer on my ear saying look you know let's move on we've got to get to the pre-match interview now and we've only got a minute and a half left before we have to go to the teams walking out you know to this show on a Tuesday where effectively we would sit in a production meeting and we'd go, look, what are the big, what are the big talking points? Okay, it'll be this, it'll be that. We would sit with the guys and go, well, how do you feel about this? And we'd go, okay, don't, don't use all your good stuff in this, but, but you know, I can tell that you've got an opinion. I know that you disagree with him. So I would have a sense of how it would go. I'd go away and talk to, to Andy, my producer, and we'd sort of go, right, okay, let's, let's do this. We've got a graphic here. We've got maybe a headline there. We've got a bit of feedback from someone here. But other than that, no moving pictures, other than maybe some shots that we could use, some, some warm-up shots or what have you, let them talk. And, you know, the show went out and it was incredible because from my point of view, what I had to learn was I had to learn to let them talk. I would regularly get the guy in my ear sort of saying, don't butt in, don't butt in, let them go. Even though I was thinking, this chat has gone on for 18 minutes and it was supposed to last for nine. And you know what? This is when the synergy between producer and presenter is so important. 
right. the producer would be in my ear because you you know this is commercial TV, so you've got a you've got a one hour show that's that's effectively you got four breaks to get away right, and you've got commercial sponsorship uh, commitments and all that to meet. Uh, but the guys would be would be just just tearing into this subject, and and we had such diversity in as, in terms of the characters. You know, you had you had Paul, who was I think just your classic expressive ex footballer who told it like a footballer would. <laughs> Steve, who came from this incredible background of having played with the very best in the world and World Cups and European Championships, and 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 for one of the greatest clubs of all time, and in an era when they were all dominant. Shebi, who was this maverick, passionate character from Malaysia, who brought a different perspective to things because mm-hmm. Shebi was a Shebi was a student of of of, of Dr. Joseph Venglos, who at one time was was an Aston Villa coach who who coached Shebi when he was playing in Kuala Lumpur, I think it was. And as a result, he he inspired Chevy to have this incredible uh, philosophy of football about about liberos and playing out from the back. And he, he was very much ahead of his time in terms of his football thinking. And and at times that would rub Steve up the wrong way, you know, famously because Steve was more of a traditional English four four two guy steeped in the great traditions of Liverpool of pass and move and don't overcomplicate things too much. So that would be great. Jamie Reeves was just this incredibly uh, intellectual cerebral voice because he, he's an economics lecturer but also a great student of the game very good footballer as well in his own right jamie as well so so everyone knew the game and everyone brought a different voice and the key to it was just getting them talking in such a way that was engaging but also as i said listening to the voice in my ear saying shut up don't talk <laughs> let them go i'll take care of I'll, I'll figure out how on earth we, we we get our commercials away this is good stuff and I think what happened, which I find fascinating, is that to this day, I, I haven't, I found you get a lot of people who produce and they're, they're terrified of timings. And, mm. and what they do is they, they look at a running order in front of them and go, and this is something the audience will probably pick up on, but audience doesn't have a running order. That's what I used to say with my producer. Is it, we know we're supposed to be going to this item next, but if this chat is so good, just drop it. Yeah. They won't know any different. They won't know any better. We haven't told them we're going to go to there. This chat is so good. So, so what we found was we had this very organic product where basically the personalities mm-hmm. of the guys was, were, came through. Um, it was strongly opinionated. I, I think we tried very hard not to be what you would call clickbait these days. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, see too much, I see too much clickbait um, editorial happening these days. It, it annoys me. I can understand why it happens because people have – uh, superiors to answer to and, and they have to talk about engagement and you know I, I think what we always felt and one of the lovely things about it was with with Chevy's sad passing yesterday I, I posted on social and there's been such an outpouring of emotion from around Asia uh, from people saying you know this is a guy who was part of our football education who made us think about football who who taught us about football um, and and I think that's what we wanted we wanted meaningful engagement back then and we got it those days we didn't have social media. All we did was we said, look, here's our email address. Send us an email. Right. And people would email. Right. And it was inc- be incredible to think that we'd just be reading out, you know, emails off paper. Um, but, the, but, but I think the key to it was that we weren't just saying we need to make you angry by giving you an opinion that will get you angry enough to sit down and type an email to us. No, it, it was all about all of us just being part of a journey, I think, in terms of the football narrative. And, and, and that's why Football Focus was very special. And I think, John, you you hit the nail on the head by describing the show as being organic, uh, you know, because uh, mm. as a viewer as well, you know, when I was watching, I felt as if I was a part of the conversation, you know, very conversational, yeah. very organic, uh, uh, raw in terms of, you know, the conversation style and, you know, uh, in many ways, a precursor to the podcasting era, That's which right. we uh, which we uh, uh, see now. And of course, you know, the different personalities of the guests, uh, uh, Shabby, of course, being an integral part uh, is what uh, really lit up the show in so many ways. Uh, you, you talked about certain skills that you, you know, you had to learn, um, uh, especially while you were moderating on Football Focus. Uh, another skill, another art that you're absolutely adept at is uh, getting the best out of your interviewees. You know, over the years, you've, uh, over the decades, you know, you've spoken with lots of people, interviewed lots of people. You know, there's some personalities with whom it can be smooth sailing, right? They're just expressive. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do, you know, as a, as a tedious a job. But with others, mm. you have to sort of, you know, press their buttons just so that you can yeah. get more yeah. out of them. You know, someone might come across as being slightly standoffish or someone mm. might just give you answers that are very cliche, you know, that sound as dry as a bone. So how exactly uh, do you, when, when you're interviewing someone who might be slightly difficult, how exactly do you get the best out of him or her? 
Good question. I think this comes entirely back to my journalistic background, because long before I was interviewing people on a football show, I had been a, a print journalist and I'd actually been fortunate that I was a feature writer. Uh, and I would go out and I would interview people, whether they be uh, sports people or whether they would be entertainers. You know, back in the day when I was doing this, I would go on uh, movie junkets. Uh, so, for example, when they launched uh, Jurassic Park, uh, I, I was flown over to L.A. and I, I interviewed Sam Neill and Laura Dern and Jeff Goldblum and, and, and guys like that. I interviewed Schwarzenegger and, and, and Stallone and all those guys back in the era of the action movies. But I would also interview um, uh, novelists like, you know, the late John le Carre, uh, or I would interview uh, musicians or, or I would interview politicians. And, and, that, and you know, what, what you do with any of those interviews is you're conscious that you do the research. You know, you, you know what you're getting yourself into, you know, what kind of a personality you try and see what they've done in the past in terms of what kind of an interview you're likely to get, what you want to be careful with, where you want to go or don't go. Um, so you do your work. Um, and I think the other thing as well is experience just taught me uh, how to handle an interview situation and how to get the best out of somebody. Um, so I think it's very, very important. Um, and, and I think that is something that you can train for and you can uh, work hard about, but you have to, again, have that flexibility and that ability to sit down and go, well, I thought this person wasn't going to be like that, but it turns out they're like that. You have to make that decision instantaneously, a bit like you're doing right now. You know, you've got a list of questions presumably in front of you, but, you know, you, you, you've got every right to go, wow, this is fun. Let's go off on a thread down here because ultimately <laughs> it comes down to you getting the best interview you can uh, out, of the, out of the subject. Um, and again, you can go in with preconceived ideas, but sometimes I think you need a degree of flexibility. And, and let's face it, from our point of view, if you've had to, and very often, as you know, an interview subject or their, their management demand that you submit a bunch of questions, effectively, you're just sitting there reading a list of questions. That's no mm -hmm, fun. Mm -hmm. What you want to yeah. do is you, you, you the, the, the fun stuff, as you know, comes with the follow-up questions, with the, the things that take you in a different direction based entirely on what you've just heard. You get a sense that this person is taking you somewhere fascinating. You've got to have the strength of um, belief in your, in your ability to, to go in that direction. Even if your producer might say afterwards, but you didn't ask that on that. I said, well, it doesn't matter because we got that. You know, and ultimately, that's, it's, it's about what you get at the end of the interview, isn't it? And, and that's a beautiful segue, you know, uh, to something else that I had in mind, which is the optimal amount of preparation whenever you might be hosting a show, whenever you might be interviewing someone. Uh, because, of course, you know, it uh, goes without saying under preparation is definitely going to expose you. But you have talked about how over preparation can backfire as well. You know, you need to have like a, mm -hmm. a certain degree of spontaneity. Uh, such that, yeah. you know, you don't you aren't necessarily following a script because that's something anyone can do. Uh, so how, how exactly do you achieve that balance? Uh, uh, whereby you don't, you, you of course aren't underprepared, but at the same time, you, you don't yeah. sound too scripted and you can actually leverage your spontaneity as well. Yeah, very good question. And, and I think it's, I think this is really one of the most important uh, skills and one of the most important areas that anybody working in, in front of a camera has to learn. Um, I have seen a trend lately towards over-preparedness um, and you hear it in commentary, which is surprising to me because there was a time when commentators will trot out a few lines at the start of a game and then just get into the the, the, the play by play. Now you get these incredibly bombastic pre-scripted speeches that someone has been crafting for two hours the night before and they're, they're, they're florid and they're vivid and what have you. But very often they're done whilst there are things happening in front of their eyes that they don't talk about. Now, I, I, I think you've got to be respectful here. Now, for, take, take, for example, the person who, who does this best. That's Peter Drury. Peter Drury has got such a tremendous way with words as a commentator mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. very often you think it's all totally scripted. It, it, it yeah. isn't. He will have certain lines that he might have thought about in advance, but he delivers it organically. I think a few people have tried to copy that by thinking, how do we do this? Oh, we write it. And I was watching some coverage of one of the major championships, the Euros, I think, earlier this summer. And I felt that one of the commentators just kept doing it just kept going off on these things. Because what happens then is you get this bizarre change of pace whereby they go from this scripted to then this totally Excellent. unscripted. And, and there's, a, there's, there's just a jarring, jolting disconnect between the two. So seamlessly, you know, as a commentator, you want it to sort of flow. So, so pepper your commentary with, with lines by all means. Be a bit more organic with your intro if you can. That's just my personal preference. So, so, so I've seen a trend towards this. And the other thing that, that, that has also come along is, is, is data. When I first started out, um, prep was tough. 
because you know the internet was in its, well, its infancy, but there wasn't as much stuff out there. You certainly there, there weren't databases, and there were there just wasn't so much information for you. So you you know you worked hard, you got a bit of information in before something happened, and then what you had to do beyond that is you had to elicit, as I said, what you could from your guest and co-commentator or pundits and what have you. So you you, you had to make sure that you. I think I think the key to to, to to this is you work hard on your prep so that you can deliver the impression of spontaneity. See where I'm going with that? What mm-hmm, I mean is mm-hmm. you put all that. It's a bit like it's a bit like a professional sports person. You put in those hours um, on the training pitch, in the nets, on the golf range, just so that when you go out on the course or the pitch, you can make it look as if you've just happened to pick the right skill for the right occasion. Makes sense. That it's not you know a pre you know uh, a predetermined course of action the mm-hmm. cricketing analogy be analogy be analogy would be you know play the ball on its merits but the right. fact that right. you know that you've got in your locker you've got every single option you could hopefully play whether it be front foot back foot whether it's playing length or, or line or what have you, you you've done the work which enables you then to, to to be able to make that choice in the moment and then i think the same thing applies with with broadcasting so I think it's very important that you, you, you get that, that, that balance right. Um, one thing going back to the data thing is that I see too many people now, just because they've, they've spent hours absorbing a stat pack. And you know, you, what happens sometimes or very often is if you're, if you're a presenter or a commentator, your producer will come to you a day or two before the game and say, right, here's your commentary stat pack. And I'll give you a wedge of paper this thick. Now, if you're a match commentator, maybe, maybe, maybe you need that information, right? Maybe you need to absorb parts of it. But here's, I think, the most important lesson that I learned early in my career and one that I would always tell anybody. Prep for what you know you're going to need. And what I mean by that is if you are a a commentator, yeah, sure, you you do need to know something about just about, gosh, I don't know, 30 players who might be involved at any stage in the game. The, The depth of knowledge is up to you. You know, do, you know, let's say you've got a, you know, a substitute left fullback for a team. Do you really need to know when they last scored a goal in, in league football? Eh, maybe, maybe you do. Maybe if, if, if they do get on the pitch and they do score a goal, you can say, well, it's his first or her first goal since so-and-so. You, you make that decision yourself. But if you're a TV presenter, what you need to do is you need to say, what am I definitely going to do in the course of this broadcast? Yeah. What are the demands of this broadcast? What in, in terms of the pre-show, that's fixed because pretty much, you know, you, you, you have your knowledge in your mind about how this team is doing, how that team is doing. You, you, you will be putting up graphics about their recent form. Certain players, you're putting stats up about them. That stuff you, you, you know is going to be there, right? But then what do you need beyond that? Well, you, you need a bit of knowledge maybe comparatively saying, well, we've just looked at that guy and I can tell you for a fact that it's not as good as so-and-so whose numbers are a little bit better. You might just know that because you've done some work on it. But, but what you mustn't do is you mustn't just cram your head full of stuff and then try and shoehorn it into the broadcast just to either justify the fact you've done all that work or slightly more <laughs> worryingly prove that you're a clever clogs and you know a bunch of stuff. Now, unfortunately, I do see that happening sometimes. And again, this, this, this screws with the presenter pundit dynamic because you don't want to be trying to flex in front of the pundit because that might diminish the pundit standing in the eyes of the right. audience. And mm-hmm. this is a big bugbear of mine, you know, and, and, and it pains me whenever I see anybody being critical of a pundit, particularly if that pundit could have maybe been helped a bit more. So let's say, for example, you've got a pundit who comes in, who's just intuitively good at describing action on the pitch. Mm-hmm. I've never been there. I've not been in a situation where it's the 89th minute of a, of a cup final and, and you're down to 10 men or what have you, but my pundit has. But maybe they don't have the depth of knowledge. Maybe they're just not in, disposed to know all the numbers. So when we're talking before we come back at full time for our analysis, if I happen to know a stat or if my statistician gets in my ear and tells me it, I'll feed it to the pundit. It's not about making me look good. Okay, mm. If it works in mm. my link, I'll use it. But if I, if I throw in a real zinger of a stat and they go to the pundit and they've got nothing to add, then that, that's not good for the broadcast or uh, not good for the pundit. So it would make more sense for me to sort of say, by the way, you might want to use this, but when we're talking about so-and-so, that was the fifth time this year that they've scored with their head, blah, blah, whatever, you know, give it to them. Because again, it's not about you, it's about the broadcast. And, 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 and I think it's very important that people recognize that. So yeah, um, I, 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 I believe in extensive prep to the point that the prep is useful for what I'm going to need on there. 
don't fill your head full of crap. <laughs> that's that's the simple that's the simple part of it. Um, it it's it, it's an individual choice, I think. But again, it comes down to this unity of the broadcast. John, you know, you you've summed up a couple of golden lessons that I've learned uh, in the recent past. You know, um, as mm. I as I grow as a broadcaster, uh, one of them being the fact that you know sometimes less is more, and the the second yeah. one being the fact that uh, as the anchor, as the presenter, uh, despite the fact that you might have more knowledge than the pundit does, you are not mm. the star of the show. The person who's yeah. sitting by your side is the star of the show. And I think it's, like it's, these two realizations, you know, have definitely been game changers for me um, as I as I develop uh, as a broadcaster. You you spoke about Peter Drury. Um, you spoke about the fact yep. that you know different presenters, different commentators have very different styles. You've got a different style. Peter Drury has a different style. Harsha Bhogle has a very different style. Uh, so it's very important for want to understand what one style is, right? Oftentimes what happens is, you know, someone growing up uh, who's looking at the likes of John Dykes, Peter Drury, Harsha Bhogle, you tend to imitate them and sometimes imitate them a bit too much as a result of which mm. you end up doing a big disservice to yourself, but not being yourself. Uh, I know it sounds a bit trite, a bit cliched, but talk mm. to me about the importance of being authentic as it pertains to expressing yourself as opposed to trying to be someone else. Yeah, that's a very good point in that um, you hear it and see it. You know, there are a lot of Peter uh, Drury clones out there in terms of the way people <laughs> deliver commentary. Um, there are a lot of people working who come up in, in presenting, presenting and, and presentation and think to themselves, oh, I need to be like that. Um, I, I think what you do is you, uh, you, you mentioned less is more earlier on. And I think that's also important that you, you mentioned the star. I would, I would say, yes, the pundit has to be the star, but the, the, the broadcast has to be the the ultimate star the broadcast mm -hmm. itself is the most important thing the pundit is a component part in that but you have to demonstrate respect for that pundit so that the audience does because basically when you're a presenter the audience follows your lead which is really interesting so there are two ways of going about this you can talk about personality and bring your own personality to it but i think you also should should maybe start by going back to a position of certain neutrality because what you mm. are doing there is you're effectively pushing the audiences it's almost like when you're in a studio right and you've got a couple of guests right when one of the guests is talking everyone everyone else has to be looking at that person right. because right. unconsciously right. what you got to do is you got to drag the audience's eyeballs there because if, if if i'm talking to someone and the other guest is is doing that the audience is going well, this can't be interesting because that guy's not right. you know not not interested so so right. so what you got to do i think is you start off as a, as, a, as a presenter in particular, by trying to just pare back a little bit on your own personality, getting into a position of neutrality, whereby your role is a, a conduit, a moderator um, uh, in some way to just, just move the broadcast along and, and what have you. At some stage, inevitably, your personality will, will, will come through. And I, and I think that's when you recognize that, hey, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, not some, I'm not like a rah, rah, big cheesy smile kind of guy. You know, if, if, if I smile, it'll be organically because someone said something funny, what have you. But I'm mm -hmm. not a look at the camera and, hey, guys, I'm not a hype MC kind of guy. So I recognize that, that, that yeah, I'm a fairly straight faced kind of, you know, uh, straight up presenter. And, and, and that's the way I do things. If I suddenly started trying to do something else, that would just be, be a bit, bit creepy, <laughs> to be honest with you. So as a result, <laughs> I think you, 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 you have an understanding of, of, of what you are. Don't go over the top with it. Um, don't become a, a parody or what have you. If you listen to commentary, listen to Danny Morrison, for example. When Danny first yeah. came along, I was like, oh my goodness, what's going on here? Because <laughs> it's the funny thing is, and it's that very funny thing where, where, where English speakers listen to Kiwis speaking English. And, and my, my analogy there is, of course, that it's like when someone plays the piano and they, they play all the wrong notes within the right order. <laughs> you know, because all the vowel sounds are kind of all over the I'm like, well, what's going on? Here? And then I realized that that was just Danny being Danny, because Danny's such a great character, uh, that, 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 it, that it wasn't, you know, like an act or anything like that. I think there are some football commentators who, who, who go for it and, and try and become like a parody, uh, you know, in terms of the, the expressions they use. But, 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 but that's, that's fine because ultimately underneath it all, you've got an exciting line delivered at just the right moment with the right amount of gravitas, with the right amount of information. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, whether it comes out of this accent or that accent or this you know, delivery style doesn't matter as long as it's right for the broadcast. And, and again, that takes me, it takes me back to, to that. And, and, you know, uh, speaking of like understanding yourself, becoming more self-aware as it pertains to your, your strengths, uh, uh, there's some people, there's some commentators, some broadcasters who are numbers led, 
versus others who might be words led uh, i believe you're in the second category uh, do you have a fascination with words uh, i have a fascination which is why i'm interested in asking you that question uh, and if so uh, do you have any practice as it pertains to honing a vocabulary becoming better at the art of word play as they call it ah uh, always yeah i mean you know i came from a background where you know for the people very often talk about this industry saying you know oh you know from a young age i knew i wanted to be a presenter well we've addressed that one i didn't want to be a presenter um i didn't know what i wanted to be to be honest with you up until my early 20s um i just didn't know i mean i i loved playing sport and i played all kinds of sport and but i never got good enough at any one sport to to be able to sort of think oh, i'm going to take that seriously so i was just somebody who played a bunch of sports and and loved it so i knew i loved sport i i'd always loved reading and literature from a very young age so i was strong at that at school and i ended up really through default more than anything choosing to to read that at university so i did an english and american literature uh, course when i went to university but but the the trigger really for me was um in getting into broadcasting was that when i got to uni i started working on a radio channel because i was really into music and and i just got a role in a radio and i realized i could do it yeah, i realized i could i could i could talk and i could present in in that context so uh, and and it sort of then got me writing a little bit so it got me into some sort, of, sort of media journalism so that's that but the to your point it, it was always to do with the words which is why when i became a newspaper uh, writer i didn't become a reporter I, i i quite frankly i had and still have no great interest in in scoops or or news reporting or and, it, and that is certainly not to to put down anyone who does that because of course mm-hmm. the tremendously important um right. arguably the most important part in uh, journalism is, is that i just found that I, i i loved reading long form articles i loved it whether it was the sunday newspapers in the old days or whether it was picking up a, a a magazine and reading at length i just that was just my favorite thing in life so being able to do that was really important to me and to this day i i i treasure fiction far more than non fiction and this will amaze you maybe it will anyway but all of my producers everyone else i work with in the industry they have bookcases full of uh autobiographies and biographies i don't mind still full of fiction i have some because people give me them and i read them occasionally but i i love the flow of um of 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 prose so much that even though journalists do a good job of writing books about footballers and football managers and cricketers and golfers it doesn't read like a piece of fiction to me and you know for me the most calming and the most enjoyable thing is to is to read a flow of uh, uh of words I, i have one for you i thought of you i was i was thinking about this interview last night and i'm just reading um i don't know why i've never got around to it before but i'm reading uh, ayn rand's book the fountainhead um okay. i'm not sure yeah. if you read it it's it, i've never it's, it's ever thought about it or yeah yeah big fat thick book but yeah. there was a description yeah. where where this this guy was uh, had to go in and talk to um the 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 dean uh, at his university which i found really fascinating and the, it it was really interesting to me that 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 this dean at the um, university who is clearly meant to be described as sort of a pop- pompous figure uh here we go so he says this guy entered the room and uh, the dean's figure swam dimly behind his desk which was carved like a confessional and it was this description of the dean that i loved it said he was a short plumpish gentleman whose spreading flesh was held in check by an indomitable dignity <laughs> and you know something like that that had me kind of chuckling all last night and 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 thinking how cool it was and i, I that's why i still i get a real buzz off that and uh, funnily enough you know you know these days we have this real dilemma um with gadgets right and i think you like i like everybody spend so much time scrolling through stuff and the danger for me and i've noticed this over the last few years is if it's the last thing i do at night or the first thing i do in the morning it kind of throws me off a little bit yeah, um yeah. certainly mm-hmm. the first thing in the morning if 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 i just wake up and start just scrolling through i just feel like i'm i'm a little bit off so i'm i'm having to try and be disciplined and say well you know get up and do some stuff move around walk the dog do whatever it may be before we start really looking at a screen I've also discovered many many years ago that that the last thing you know before I close my eyes and go to sleep is I I love to read um and and I love to read literature um uh, because I find with fiction that the the flow, things like that little line I just get the flow of the prose the 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 words on a page they calm me you know they 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 send me off. whereas if I've actually been watching moving pictures video or if I've been actually scrolling through stuff or engaging with stuff on social it just gets my brain all jam- jumbled up so 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 literature is hugely important to me and i found that i sleep better if i have a book so so i will always have a book a work of fiction next to my bed 
And I will, if possible, even if I'm going to bed at three in the morning, try and read a few pages before I sleep. I just feel it sends me off. So, so words are very important to me. And, and as a journalist from a very young age, learning how to be economical, expressive, appropriate with, with the usage of words was very important to me. And, and it continues to be, you know, you, you, you never lose that. You never lose that um, understanding that, that, that being able to communicate is massively important. And sometimes economy with words, as you know, uh, will lead to, if I, if I can get my introduction to someone done efficiently, I'll get more time to, to, to listen to them. Uh, if I can use just the right word throwing to a commercial break, it'll mean the audience definitely wants to hear what we have to say afterwards. And when I was doing Premier League Live, especially, I found that was a great challenge and we had a lot of fun. We would, the lower third caption that would go on a little teaser to a break, if I could complement that with just the right word, then I, that, that was a real skill for me. It was a, a little, little piece of art that me and the producer could work on. That was cute. We've said something cute going to the break. The audience can't wait to see what we have when we come back. So yeah, very important. And John, I know we're closing in on the hour mark. So a couple of, uh, you know, final questions for you before we conclude. Uh, you talked about, uh, you know, having a fascination with words. Uh, and you also alluded to the fact that, you know, one of the downsides of having a very strong vocabulary is the fact that, you know, sometimes you aren't precise with your speech. Was that something you found difficult when you were starting out? Uh, just, you know, maintaining economy as it pertains to words, being precise in your speech as opposed to being overly wordy? Yeah, very important. I think the other thing as well is that you also have to be appropriate to your, to your audience. Again, a bit like stats. Don't go showing off the fact that you know uh, very, very big words. If, if, if you're using, you know, you know, when people, it got very trendy for a while to talk about somebody being somewhat disingenuous. But I think if you use a word like disingenuous in a sports broadcast, I don't think so. Um, I, I, and I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not patronizing an audience saying that if you're a sports fan, you're not going to have a, a, an education. No, I just think by and large, you have to use a vocabulary that is appropriate to, to, the, to the kind of broadcast you're putting out. If you're sitting doing a, you know, a very high, highbrow arts review show, yeah, by all means, get, the, get all the guns out, <laughs> go for it. But I think you just have to use vocabulary that is appropriate. Um, and I think what's nice is being able to not dumb it down um, and not just, just, tap into cliches and, and, and hot. the sport sports uh, uh, um, vocabulary has been guilty of some real horrors, hasn't it? You know, there, there are expressions that we use and we just, you know, we trot them out. And if you think about it, it's absolute nonsense, you know, and, and there's a lot of very archaic references, you know, people used to talk about, he's hit that like an exocet. I mean, an exocet was a missile, a ship to ship missile, I think that was used mainly most famously in the Falklands war. So for heaven's sake, if you're in 2015 or 19 or 21 <laughs> and you're commentating and you get that, how many people are going to understand what you're talking about or a howitzer or a tracer bullet? I mean, really, right. uh, you know, you hear these things no, I, 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 or, or you hear somebody saying like he set, he set his stall out there. What, you, you, mm -hmm. you think people are going to go back to the old days of marketplaces and putting out your stall? And so so I, I get, you know, as you can tell, I get a little bit grumpy about that. I'd, I'd like to sort of say, come on, let's, let's try and use language that's appropriate uh, to, to, to the audience and to the moment. So I think it's very important, yeah. And John, uh, some of your favorite sporting personalities, these necessarily, these don't necessarily have to be people you've interviewed. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be players, could be managers as well. Uh, but mm. some of your favorite personalities. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, sure, sure. Personalities. Wow. I, I, if we start, broadcast to start off with, I, I have tremendous respect and admiration for, for, for just about anyone who works at a very top level of, of, of any sports presentation. Um, Richie Benno, I mentioned, uh, you mentioned right at the top. I've spoken about him in the past. The thing about Richie Benno that was fascinating was not only was he a tremendously successful cricketer, test cricketer and, and, you know, and a leader for Australia, but as a broadcaster, he, he did so much that defined the way that I think broadcast should be done, uh, not least of which, funnily enough, was economy of words. You know, the Richie Benno thing would be very much something happens and he was always conscious of crowd sound and atmosphere and, 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 and let, let, let it breathe. You know, he would very often sort of say, right, something happens, let the crowd sound come through and then just say, Oh dear, or something like that. And those two words told you, told you all you needed to know. If you're looking at a replay of a guy just playing down the wrong line or doing something, you know, or dropping a catch or whatever it may be, you don't need to, to, to pontificate and fill every second up with, you know, your words. 
no, let, let, let the broadcast flow and breathe. And I think that was something that I, I loved about Richie Bello. And, and then everything that he did that then filtered down through one of my favorite teams of broadcasters would have been that Channel 9 team when you had Bill Laurie and you had Richie and you mm-hmm. had Ian Chappell and you had Tony Gregg. Different personalities, just different voices, different approaches. And, and I'm a big cricket fan, as you know. I mean, I started off working in cricket before I moved into football. So, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time watching and listening to cricket. So I, I love listening to, you know, when you have two recent former test cricketers like Atherton and Hussain, who got onto the Sky mm-hmm. roster, they took cricket broadcasting to a level that I found really, really enjoyable. I think as, 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 a, as, a, as a viewer watching in India, you're blessed because you have some, you mentioned Harsha, you have some great broadcasters and great talents. I've, I've been lucky to work with Sonal Gavaskar for many, many years in the past. And, you know, I just think there are some great voices in, in, in Indian cricket coverage as well that, that I admire. So cricket coverage, I love. Uh, football, I grew up with just a, a, a whole bunch of guys who presented well. But in this day and age, I quite like the fun stuff. You know, like I, I like the sort of silly stuff like Soccer AM and things like that. I like right. it when guys can take football into an area that's really fun and, and, and present. I like the guys. I like the way they do what they do. That, that, that's good fun. Um, so, so, yeah, I, I just like it. I, I love UFC. Um, I'm a big fan of UFC. So I, I love watching the broadcast. I mean, when UFC go to town on a fight and, you know, John Annex with working with, with Joe Rogan and, 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 and uh, DC and guys like that, I just like, I like the, I like, I like the, the, the flow and what they do. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's broad. I mean, I, listen, I could go on. There was a rugby commentator called Bill McLaren, who was this, this lovely Scottish guy who had this beautiful accent. That the, and for me, that reminded me of childhood watching rugby internationals as soon as I heard his voice. So, so yeah, so, so much in broad cast sports wise I, I i could go on and on forever um when i was growing up i i i'm, I'm from essex originally graham gooch was captain of, of, of essex in england and he was just such a resolute batsman at a time when england weren't the best team but he always got out there and, and faced the, the the west indies or aussies and and and, and gave it what he could I, I just and i've met him a few times i liked him a lot uh, i love michael holding funnily enough talking about the west mm-hmm. indies because when i was young i used to run a lot i used to run track and i, and I loved athleticism and when i could when i saw michael holding just just smoothly just pouring to the crease and about to deliver that was just beautiful to watch so um cricket and cricketers i i, I admired i always, always loved footballers who i felt could do everything i admired players like brian robson when i was growing up because he had the ability to tackle to pass to score goals to lead um and by the same token the players who could do magical things you know the the, the sort of you know maradonas and ronaldinho's and what have you the personalities that i admire um no i i i'm just i'm blessed to have been able to to come face to face with people so bobby robson uh the late newcastle and, and england manager mm-hmm. wonderful man wonderful man i was fortunate to to work with him to spend some time with him socially um and and i think if i'm going to leave you with one message i i i firmly believe and i've learned throughout the course of my career that it's sport it's not really life or death no no matter what people will tell you it's not politics or any of those big heavy things or religion it's sport and 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 it's uh, it's something that is a uh, is a conduit for joy um and and people who play coach commentate on or watch football and do so with a with a spirit of joyfulness they're the people that I find I'm, I'm, I'm most attracted to one way or another. Uh, and, and, and if, if they've also, if they're also disciplined and hardworking, then, then that, that's a bonus as well. So that, that's what I get most out of the people of sport. Absolutely. You know, despite the fact that I'm an engineer by qualification, despite the fact that I worked for, for Goldman Sachs for a couple of years in New York, I think sport for me, you know, has been the, the biggest teacher. And, you know, growing up watching sport, uh, you were certainly an integral part of my viewing experience. So John Dykes, I mean, thank you so much. If you had told me, you know, if I could rewind maybe 10 years, if someone told me that one day I'm going to be having like a long-term conversation with John Dykes, I would have pinched myself. But really, really appreciate you carving time out. Uh, had a gem of a time. Um, and I hope uh, this was worth your time as well. Oh, very much so. And, and uh, you know, I think it's very important. That if, if someone wants to hear what you have to say, then really take that as, a, as, as the highest compliment there could be. So I hope I haven't bored you. I know I went off at all sorts of tangents there, hopefully some tangents that you found interesting. And uh, I, I wish you all the best with, uh, with your career as well. Thank you so much, John. And I loved it. Look, I, I told you, you know, before the start of this conversation that I want this to be as organic, free-flowing and conversational as, as possible, as opposed to, you know, me simply going down a list of bullet points that I have. <laughs> and so it, it, it totally lived up to the billing. So thank you so much. You're most welcome. Take care. Cheers, John. Take care. Thank you.